<laughs> this is funny. It's on your white shirt, so I can't see it. What? Uh, the time date stamp. It's March 24th, 1995. Okay. Do you need to prompt that up? And or it's 214 or so. 220. Yeah, about 215 or so. Okay, it looks like it's close enough to I'm, I'm being right. How old I, am. I was only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I know when you were in second grade, now was in third grade. Really? Okay, we're recording, so <laughs> you we'll tell all. You wore the cutest little jumper suits to school. Hmm? You wore the cutest little jumper suits to school. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is uh, Maxine uh, Jowers Frederick, and Ruth Rockwell and Flo Snyder are here talking to her, and she's going she's gonna to tell us about Fairhope from her point of view, okay? How did you get here? <laughs> uh, as a babe in arms. <laughs> I, I always tell everybody I'm a native because I was almost born in Fairhope. I came here when I was very small. Um, and I was born, let me see, in 1920. And we came here shortly after. And my father was uh, Bob Jowers. And my mother was Lolite. And I had a sister, Lois, and a brother, Robert, who died when he was 12 years old. I was the youngest. But anyway, we came here and we lived on Delamar Street, which back in those days we called Pig Alley because we had no <laughs> paved street. Well, I, I don't know if they called it that then when I was older, we called it that. There were no paved streets and, and there was a one of those kind of constant, always mud holes. In fact, there were about two or three of them up and down that street. It just, they couldn't stop the mud holes. And, um, our backyard, you see, our our we our backyard faced Fairhope Avenue, mm -hmm. and uh, practically everybody lived right around uptown. Nobody would have lived on the Bay back in those days because they didn't have central heat, and the and the uh, houses were really built for summer houses, and and they didn't people didn't like to live on them except uh, on North Bayview. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some houses there, and. Uh, they were mostly retired Northerners who lived along there. Um, were they, um, did they come down with, the, oh, well, in 1920, yeah, you. Yeah, you 1920, the there, there were, uh, uh, one of the people who built a home there was uh, Mr. Tone, and uh, he was a law partner of, who was the monkey trial man? Oh, Clarence Darrow. Clarence Darrow. You can tell how old I am. Clarence Darrow, he was a law partner of his. And Clarence Darrow's sister used to come down here. In fact, I think she lived here. Yes, yeah, she did. And um, later, in that same neighborhood, um, the Youngs built a house there, Ralph Young and his wife, uh, which is still standing. It's a very large California cottage. And uh, But before that, the Youngs and all the people lived right up around town. The Youngs practically moved out of Fairhope when they moved to North Bayview. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, we had a large group of children in, in the area. And uh, they all lived right around on Fairhope Main Avenue, mm -hmm. where uh, the um, Eastern Shore Courier office is now. Mm -hmm. There was a house there. And the Taylors lived there, and they owned a restaurant on Fairhope Avenue. Oh, I remember and, that uh, name. <laughs> yeah. And the Shields owned a restaurant on Fairhope mm -hmm. Avenue, and they lived above the restaurant. And uh, the people who owned the telephone company um, lived right there on Fairhope Avenue, about where the fabric store is now. And uh, they had three children. And uh, the Youngs lived right there on Delamar and Section Street. And uh, any number of people lived right in that area. And then there was an area down Fells Avenue. Mm -hmm. Some of the people lived down Fells Avenue that were housing. And uh, <clears throat> on our street, the Berglunds lived on the corner. Mm -hmm. uh, we were the next house to the Berglunds, but there was an empty lot. The back of the hotel was between us. And uh, my father uh, was a barber, and he had this big barber shop that had a pool hall on the back of it, and public showers. Mm -hmm. Now these were the days when people had public showers. You know, you, I, everybody, I guess, didn't have 
running water, and, and I guess people would come, well, they had showers down at the bay too, but, but there were public showers there at, at that place in the back of the pool hall. And uh, he was also like the barber pole with the red, that means like doctor. Mm -hmm. And everybody came to him to get the splinters out of their feet when they got splinters at uh -oh. the pier. <laughs> and when they had any cuts and stuff, you know, uh, he was sort of like a paramedic because he had the sterile thing there, the boiling oh, water that he yeah. boiled the towels and the sterile everything. And he had a lot of instruments and things and he took splinters out and he did all sorts, he did black eyes and he took care of all sorts of, you know, minor ailments. But uh, that, that uh, uh, barbers all over did that back in those days. And I think that's a very funny thing when I remember back. Mm -hmm. But um, there were very few automobiles. I remember the Youngs had an automobile and the Berglunds, but they both owned stores. And I suppose the Pittmans did. Um, but I can remember that all the, they used to take us riding in the evening. They'd come by and take our family, different friends, for a ride mm -hmm. in their little model T Fords or whatever they had. That was a, a big event, I guess. Oh, yeah, a big event to go the riding. The Pittmans always had, and had a racing horse and, and a buggy. Who? The Pittman boys. Oh, yeah, and they, they, they had the, the delivered papers. Before. They delivered papers, yeah, Cecil and Ike. But, um, The streets were not paved, of course. But it's probably just as well there weren't that many cars. <laughs> well, yeah, but, but uh, even much later, they, they didn't have paved streets. But we did have sidewalks and curbs. Mm -hmm. So that was nice because the streets were a, a muddy mess. Mm -hmm. And when I see these old cowboy movies, you know, with the, with the people, the ladies picking their dresses up and tipping across the muddy streets, I mean, we did that in Fairhope for years. <laughs> And uh, I remember the Depression years. Well, Fairhope was just a wonderful place for children to grow up. We, when I was like two or three years old, I had the run of the town. You know, I could run through to Daddy's office, and I would go up and down Main Street and call on everybody, and people would give me nickels and buy me ice cream cones, and it was a lot of fun. <laughs> but uh, uh, nobody ever worried about you. And. Uh, it was just a very safe, wonderful place for children. And of course, as we got a little older, we had the bay and we met down there and everybody went swimming. And then we had a teen club and when we got older than that that everybody congregated at the La Coroma and danced. And it was like a family thing because uh, John and Amy Parker ran it and they knew everybody and you stayed in line and besides it, it was all glass across the front and your family could sit out there and watch what you were doing. <laughs> and, if, and if they weren't there, Amy and John told them if you did anything wrong. <laughs> and we didn't think of a whole lot to do wrong, did we? <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, but we used to, um, a date back in those days when I was in high school with uh, a fellow would have 25 cents and you could walk to the La Corona and a nickel Two nickels for the uh, for the jukebox. No, two nickels for cokes and fifteen cents for the jukebox. That was it. That was, and if everybody had that, it made yeah. the evening. <laughs> and uh, that was when times were better. <laughs> but during the real depression years, things got really bad here because it wasn't too good before that because there were still some tariffs on things shipped north, and the farmers in the south had been having a very rough time. You know, ever since the Civil War, I guess things just didn't come back as they did in the north. But um, I remember when the depression really hit hard, people's salaries practically disappeared and a lot of people lost their jobs. And But everybody before that had had a maid because, you know, you just did. And even though we, we would be considered very poor people in this day, but you had a, somebody who washed for you and, you know, took care of the mm -hmm. clothes and cleaned the house, that sort of thing maybe once or twice a week, and maybe a lot of people had them five days a week if they had a lot of children. But uh, the bad part was that you couldn't let the maid go because there was no relief back then. Mm -hmm. And they would starve, and their children would starve. So all the young mothers and had to think of some way to help make a living for the family. And 
they would sew, or they would, uh, I, one lady made potato chips and put them up in little bags and they sold preserves or they did everything to keep the maids. Mm -hmm. Not for the help the maids, but so the maids' children and the maids wouldn't starve, you know. that and They were, um, and my mother and dad, uh, my mother had remarried by that time and she married to Bill Funk then, who worked at the Fairhope Hardware and later owned it, but uh, they sold the car. <laughs> they had a Ford Roadster with a rumble seat. Oh, that was great. And uh, they sold the automobile and fixed the house up into a rooming house. And mother rented out rooms to school teachers. And uh, they came in one day, or they were talking to mother, and they mentioned these children that came to school without any lunch. And my mother just couldn't stand that. And she was a young woman at the time. Um, you see, she died in the 19, in early 1960, she died in 1950, early 1950s, I guess. Uh, when she was 54 years old. Now. <laughs> anyway, mother decided that she had to check this out, so she went up to the school, the public school in Fairhope, and the public school in Fairhope, and uh, talked to these children. And she found out it wasn't one or two, it was a lot of children in that school who didn't oh have any lunch. Goodness. And uh, she talked to them, and, then, and she came home just in tears, and she said, these children would say, she'd say, well, did you have breakfast this morning? No, ma'am. Oh, my goodness. Are you going to have dinner tonight? Oh, well, no, they'd say, they, she'd say, they'd say, I had anything to eat all day. And she said, this one little boy just broke her heart. She said, uh, you know, did you have any lunch? No. Did you have any breakfast? No. And his face just lit up with this big smile. He said, but I'm going to have a half a sweet potato for dinner tonight. Oh, my goodness. Uh, and she was just devastated. So she put boxes around in all the stores for people to put their change in and got the bread companies to give her day old bread and the big sandwich bread and uh, got the creamery to give her the milk real cheap and she skim, the five skim milk. Was it skim milk? I no mean, I know they gave away skim milk. Pardon? They gave away skim milk. Uh, I don't remember. Maybe it was skim milk. Uh, mm -hmm. I just remember the two big five gallon cans, which, you know, she was feeding a lot of kids. Uh, and we didn't have cars, so her dear friend Frances Crawford would come come down every day and pick her up. And here she, the, the cook would be fixing our dinner. And mother would be out in the kitchen making these stacks and stacks of sandwiches. Oh uh, she would grind up raisins and peanut butter and try to make nourishing things for these kids, you know. And she make these stacks and stacks of sandwiches. All, half the kitchen would be full of sandwiches. And these two gallon, and Aunt Frankie would pick up the milk in the car, and then she'd come pick up Mother, and they would take it up to the school. And she did that for two years and, or longer. My goodness. Every day out in the kitchen making sandwiches for those kids. So it was, there was no Red Cross. There was no crippled children. There was no, no anything. No, And uh, as young as she was, my mother was Mrs. Relief. And uh, if somebody <coughs> house burned down, if they were sick and couldn't afford the medicine, um, if you know any bad thing happened, they were knocking on our back porch. Mm -hmm. And she would find blankets. She would find, you know, whatever. She would go out scratching, and she collected things when people had. A, she had the attic just full of stuff. So a lot of times she'd just go up the attic and get stuff and oh. bring it down. And uh, she was our, she was the Goodwill Industries of the 1930s, yes. <laughs> except she didn't sell anything. Oh, but, that's right, uh, they sell their stuff. Uh, Salvation Army. Doc, yeah, <laughs> Doc, Dr. Goodard lived across the street from us. And two, three, one o'clock in the morning, any time, day or night, he would back out and take off, going out in the country to anybody, you know, just um, whoever was sick any race or whatever, you know, they, he, if anybody called Dr. Goodard, went. Mm -hmm. And there was no hope of getting anything in payment from most of the people he called. And he went out and delivered babies, he went out and stitched people up, he took care of all sorts of things. And uh, sometimes he would get a chicken or some eggs, mm -hmm. or if they killed a hog, they'd give him a 
piece of meat, you know, whatever. They, they wanted to pay, but they just didn't have any money to pay. Right. And, uh, but boy, I have a beautiful picture of him taking care of all those people. He just was marvelous. Never questioned whether anybody could pay or not. Can you believe days like that? Yeah, I remember, I remember <laughs> days like that. Yeah. You remember that, don't you? Yeah, I remember that. And I um, think we were, we were more fortunate than some. Some way, we managed, all, we always had food because we lived out in the country and we had cows and we had a uh, uh, garden mm -hmm. and uh, mother would take things in, around town and sell them, you know. Yeah, everybody was, did what they could. Yeah, and we always had lots of fruit and mother canned and canned. And I remember one, one year she canned 300 quarts of tomatoes. <laughs> Mm. My mother canned, my mother and, and Bill Funk's mother would get yeah. together and can things like priceless things like um, sand pears even, mm -hmm. you know, and watermelon rind pickles, which I hated. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, nothing was wasted. They just, uh, and we had a garden, it was a big lot in the back of our house that went with the property. That, mm -hmm. And uh, Bill had a big garden out there. And, his father had a garden in back of his house, and so they would put up a lot of things. But I can remember the wonderful springs with all that marvelous food. Oh, all the fresh vegetables, the peas and the beans and the corn and the tomatoes and everything right out of the garden. Oh. <laughs> well, I still look forward to that. <laughs> For I don't have a garden, but I look forward to somebody else's. <laughs> but it doesn't taste the same because you don't get them right out of the garden and into the pot the way we did back then. You know, you. Well, if somebody gives you vegetables out there, oh, yes, that's what yes. I meant. <laughs> oh, you cultivate your friends who have gardens. Huh? Right. <laughs> <laughs> not not bad. But uh, we were. Everybody was so poor during the depression, but nobody told us. So we didn't know and we didn't care. We thought we were fine. <laughs> I don't remember worrying about it, do you? We just no. had some wonderful years. We they were just great years. Uh, well, we I, were too young to, to know, really. Well, no, because I was... I was too young to know. <laughs> you were too young to know. I was not too young to know. Um, <clears throat> um, but my mother could sew, so we always had nice clothes, my sister and myself. And, uh, Things, I mean, you could buy materials very cheap, I guess, back in those days. Everything was pretty cheap. I mean, you could buy a car for like, what, $400, $500, mm -hmm. something like or that. Or less, yeah, I think. I maybe, heard of maybe figures. less, I really don't 200. remember. But, uh, <laughs> oh, uh, it was hard to get that much money, too. Mm -hmm. That was a whole year's supply of money to our family. Yeah. I mean, actual cash. Right. That's right. But uh, mother sewed and, and uh, the garden and and she even raised chickens in the backyard. My mother loved chickens for some reason. When we lived up on uh, Delmar Street, she had a chicken yard. She just loved to raise chickens. I guess because she liked chicken two and a half pounds. That's when they were right. Yeah. <laughs> they had to be two and a half pounds, and uh, you couldn't buy chickens like that. So she had to raise her own, and she seemed to like the chickens like to go out and feed chickens and that sort of thing and gather eggs and also the, that was nice egg, but we didn't we had eggs at Delamar Street but we didn't have eggs in Farrell. She just raised chickens in little pens until they got two and a half pounds <laughs> and then look out. <laughs> <laughs> at that time uh, the feed the, and flour that came, that came in cloth bags and my mother sewed, and she sewed for us, and she sewed for other people with those, with that material. And there were a lot of people, neighbors that we had that. You know, they dye it, right? Well, they some came of, with. Oh, yeah, some, some of them were splitting. Right, I remember that. Yeah. yeah. The larger ones came with yeah. patterns. The white was, mother used for dish towels. Yeah, the mm -hmm. white was really awesome. terrific for dish towels. The flower bag, flower sacks, underwear. But we just had a marvelous time. We ran in crowds, you know, we had a whole bunch of friends because we all lived right there together. And, and it was always just a whole gang of kids walking to school together and coming home together and hanging around in the afternoon. And uh, it was a marvelous 
time. Remember playing in the gullies? Mm hmm That was that was something else. <laughs> I can remember we lived down on Keeper Street when when I was about seven or eight years old. And uh, right after Mother and Bill Funk were married, and there's a sand hill gully there that comes right up, I guess it's between Oak and Keeper, right in there someplace. And we could get at the top, it was just this sandy hill and just slide down. Mm. And we just loved to do that. <laughs> Althea Fuller and Bunny Young and the Tone Kids and Chloe and I, but there'd been some accidents in the gully where the children, the, the gullies had caved in on some children and killed them. They're they happened a couple of times. They had dug into the side of the gully, I suppose. But Mother was afraid for us to play down there. She said, absolutely, you cannot play down there. And we would come home and say, you have been to the gully. And she would read with them. We don't know how she knew that. You know, <laughs> of course, when you got down the bottom of this hill, it was red clay. Yeah, and we had yeah, red white, clay all white over White Batiste <laughs> underpants. And, and we'd come home with red clay all over the, <laughs> all over the underpants. Couldn't figure out how she knew. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's where mothers get mother's <laughs> intuition from, <Right. laughs> those little clues they picked up. <laughs> but we really, I've talked to so many of my friends about how much we really enjoyed the Depression years. And they had movies for five cents on Saturday. Mm -hmm. And then eventually they had free movies on Saturday. Of course, they were these old tired grade Z westerns. <laughs> but uh, uh, the merchants would get together and pay Mr. Fuller, I guess it was, to run these movies on Saturday free to bring people into town to shop. And then they had a, a raffle, and there was a picture in one of the Fairhope calendars of all these people standing around by the Busy Bee Garage and by Cummings Hall right up on Fairhope Avenue, which was across from the Creamery, um, where Shermer Pecan is now and where the college is. And there was people standing up at the back of a flatbed truck or something, and, and all these people mobbed around. And I don't think they said what it was, but that was the wrath, that was the drawing on Saturday afternoon when they drew for $50 or $20. Oh, <laughs> wow. It seemed like tremendous and, But they, you know, the merchants would give out tickets to the people who came in to shop. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe they didn't do it every Saturday, but they'd, they'd come in and shop on Saturday, and then once a month or once or I don't know how many they'd have this drawing and give away money and boy, I don't know, it probably wasn't much, but it was a, it was a lot to those, to those people to back in those days. Yeah, it was enough to attract a crowd. <laughs> that's that's uh, interesting, I don't think anybody's mentioned that. And then, um, of course, I'm sure you've had plenty of, in, of information about the organic school. But, uh, well, of course, they have their own tapes, they've taped yeah, I, I like two hundred people them, or so yeah. for, for the school. But uh, that was Fairhope was such an interesting place growing up because it was we were intellectually gifted. I don't mean the the people. I mean the town was because it had so many people who came progressive thinkers. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. Uh, because of the single tax colony and the uh, organic school, which was progressive education and. Uh, I met somebody, or we, Paul and I met somebody just the other night and mentioned that he was the uh, great nephew of Marietta Johnson. And uh, they said, oh, my mother went to one of her schools up in Long Island, you know. Mm -hmm. I've forgotten where we were, but it was not Fairhope someplace. But uh, it was very, I mean, it was the first new one, no Fairhope, you know, mm -hmm. they were new here or something. But. Uh, she had a school in Connecticut, one in Long Island, here and there. But uh, all of the famous people that used to come through Fairhope were, yeah. and we went to school with uh, twins from Germany. Do you remember the? Uh, yeah, I knew about them. I didn't. Yeah, I and wasn't uh, close to there was a boy in our class from Mexico City, mm -hmm. and. Um, yeah, the school home was really sort of a... Yeah, the school home was going strong back in those days. They, they had a lot of boarding students. And uh, Rachel Lindsay's children went to school here, the poet. And uh, we had visitors like Dorothy Canfield Fisher and Robert Oppenheimer, the physicist, and 
John Dewey, the educator, and uh, Clarence Darrow came and spoke mm -hmm. here. Who? Clarence Darrow. Oh yes, Clarence Darrow, and uh, we were pretty small then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there were just any number of very famous people who came to the Felses. Yeah, I was gonna say Fells Avenue. Just Fels. <laughs> yeah. But uh, we didn't. We weren't really impressed with these people. The Tones. They were. I mean, they were all just the ones who lived here. Were just Fairhope people, and they. This is what we expected. <laughs> <laughs> that was. That was great. I remember that Fairhope had some bloomer girls when they were. When they were uh, that was a joke in Mobile years ago that Fairhope had bloomer girls over here. And they walked in the streets. Well, it was easier to walk in the street. But they weren't paved, they were sandy ruts, you know, but, but there were roots and everything in the sidewalk. We didn't have sidewalks except right downtown. And the Mobile people used to think that was so funny. All these feral people walked in the street. <laughs> and they they thought it was perfectly normal. Okay. That's what we did. <laughs> they, they were walking the streets. They weren't street walkers. And Fairhope, uh, my family, on both my mother's and father's side, have been in South Alabama since right after the Revolutionary War. Uh, the Revolutionary War ancestors came and settled in Clark County. and. Uh, Excuse me. Um, so that's many generations. But then I grew up in Fairhope and went to organic school where we had the boarding students, a lot of people from the north. And uh, Fairhope was founded by, I mean, it was not just a little southern town. It was founded it's by very northerners. Very typical. Yeah. And uh, it didn't have a southern background. And when I went to work at the Merchants National Bank in Mobile when I got out of school, everybody called me Yankee and Brooklyn and mocked everything I said. Oh my goodness. And made fun of me because of the way I talked. At 16 miles as the crow flies. <laughs> and it was, it was as if I was from another world. They had never heard anybody talk so silly. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, they haven't stopped doing it. I moved up to North Carolina in 1973, and they said, well, you don't talk like you're from Alabama. <laughs> well, let me tell you a funny thing. I belong to these historical patriotic societies like Colonial Danes and D.A. They have these conventions, and they always, you know, welcome you at the table, and they sign you in, and all the ladies are so lovely and everything. And I come in, and... Everybody is so cool to me, and I just couldn't understand. I would try to be friendly with these people, and I got, you know. And finally, I had to get up and give a report at one of the meetings. And they time you. You can only do three minutes, because some of the people go on forever, you know. And this little boinger goes off, and I, my report was very short. And I started away from the mic, and I turned to the president, and I said, may I come back for just a moment? She said, sure, because the timer hadn't gone off and I went back and I said, it finally had dawned on me. I said, I was born and raised in South Alabama and I cannot help it if I talk like this. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody was so friendly to me after that. Oh my god. They goodness. thought I was a Yankee. <laughs> <laughs> was this the daughters of the Confederacy? <laughs> no, no. This was D A R and Colonial Day, but you know, they're all Southerners, and yeah, I just Southern. didn't talk the way they did. <laughs> I didn't know that the, that the Colonial Dams were all Southerners. Oh, well, the ones here. The, the ones, ones here are. Yeah, yeah, all yeah. Ones. These are the local groups yeah, I'm talking about. Groups. I'm not talking about national, just yeah. like the state convention and stuff like that. <laughs> but um, it's, it's well, really bad, because I love a Southern accent. And I'm sorry I missed out on that, but there's nothing worse than a put-on Southern accent. That's true. Do that. <laughs> That's true. Tell us what in 19, well, let's see, World War II started in 1930. Now, were you married by that time? or? or no, I was married during the war, during 1943. The war. Okay. Well, I know mm -hmm. your uh, husband, Paul, was in the service. And that's yes, why. Mm -hmm. when he so graduated. What, can you th remember what, how you thought about it when, World War II started. Oh, indeed I can. I remember it distinctly because I had 
I had an uh, appendicitis operation. I was, I was working at the bank at the time. And I was working at the bank before the tunnel was open. And we had to drive up across the old Cochrane Bridge and down. And, and they opened the tunnel while I was working there. But uh, some girls from the bank drove over to see me. And uh, because I was homesick, I hadn't been back to the hospital, uh, back to work. And they walked in the door announcing. Oh, my. They'd heard it on the radio on the way over. So, of course, we turned on the radio and sat there in absolute shock. But uh, things really changed around here during the war. And going to Mobile, and, and I had forgotten this for years. And I, it just came back in a flash not too long ago. Each one of the bridges on the old causeway, mm -hmm. there was a gun emplacement with any aircraft guns and soldiers. Do you remember that? No, because we weren't here during that oh, time. Oh, well, I, had, <laughs> I went away for 30 years and came back, but I hadn't gone away then. But, but they had anti-aircraft guns at those bridges because Mobile was a, and they caught spies here mm -hmm. in Fairhope. And uh, we had submarines, of course, thick in the gulfs out here. It was, they, we knew people who were in the uh, merchant marine, and they said they would go all over the world, glad up battle Vladivostok and back and all over, but they said they really started sweating when they got in the Gulf of Mexico because, you know, they lost so many ships out there. Mm. But uh, I was working at, when I was working at the bank, the people from the seafood company came in, this man who owned the seafood company there, and starfish and oyster, and he wanted to get money. All these guys wanted to be paid off. He was losing all his health because they were out on the boat a fishing boat out in the Gulf, and the submarine came up right beside him. Oh my goodness! And or came up and told him to stop, and and they didn't or something. They they were so shocked they just kept going, and they shot right across the bow of the boat. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know what happened after that, but anyway, they when they finally got the boat underway and came back in, they were so scared and so excited, they didn't even stop the boat when they got to the wharf. They just went <laughs> right into the wharf, you oh know. My goodness. But they were terrified. Well, they were not it, going back it, out there. Was it a German submarine? Mm -hmm. or? Okay. And the man who was on the front had been a, I think a consul, a German consul in Mobile, spoke perfect English. He had on a pair of shorts, khaki shorts and everything. And they um, sank a submarine off Pensacola. And the stuff that floated up to the top, Malbus bread wrappers, Sanger Theater tickets. Hmm. They were shopping right here on the coast, coming and going. I don't know how they did it, but my <laughs> goodness, uh, they were getting all their supplies right here on shore. Now that's the first time I've ever heard it about that. And uh, when I was working at the bank, the fellow that worked at Point Clear found a tank of gasoline, had some riding on it, and gas was rank, rationed. I mean, this gasoline, this big tank of gasoline was just a, he was mm. delighted with it, you know? <clears throat> and uh, so I got a call at the bank one day from the FBI, and uh, they wanted to know about this tank of gasoline, because this guy rode back and forth. I didn't ride with him, I rode with somebody else, but I knew about it, so I told him what I knew, and who it was and everything. They said, well, I hesitated to tell them. They said, well, we're not gonna do anything to him. It's perfect, all right, he hadn't done anything wrong. We just wanna get the numbers off this tank. So uh, I told them who it was. And but see, that had come off a submarine. Mm -hmm. And um, Bill Funk, my stepfather, worked at the shipyard. He, my father had to register in the first draft. I was the only one my age who had that happen. <laughs> but, uh, he didn't want to be drafted because mother could hardly get by on $60 a month. But uh, So he gave up his job at the Arrow Hardware and went to work at the shipyard. And he was foreman of the ship after it was launched, you know, to all the insides and the superstructure and all that. He was foreman over all that business. And his first ship, he got to know the crew, and they had a Navy crew that went out on all these merchant ships, a little anti-aircraft gun in the front or back or someplace, and uh, he went on the um, shakedown cruise with them. 
after this, you know, launched the first ship, they finished the first ship, and uh, came back in. Everything was fine. The ship went down to Galveston, or Houston one, and got loaded. Came back up right off the mouth of Mobile Bay. They sank it. Mm. And they killed the fellows and the crew. They, you know, the gun, mm -hmm. they shot right through the front of the boat and killed all those little sailors that, and Bill was really upset about that. He really, losing the ship was bad, but not, but knowing those fellows that were killed that was really, even yeah. worse, yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess the rest of the crew had time to get off if they didn't make mm -hmm. it. But that ship never made any run except to Texas and back to the mouth of Mobile Bay. Oh, goodness. And they caught a spy here. I remember him well. <laughs> um, he came up to the organic school putting on this display of things from Mexico. And I started asking him some questions. And uh, he gave me this really short answer. He was real nasty. And I went in and I told Miss Bell, I said, there's something wrong with that fella, I think. She, and she said, well, yeah, she said she, she thought so too, because it was just a bunch of junk. I mean, you know, this was tourist junk he had up there. What was he doing with that? It was an excuse to be in Fairhope. Mm -hmm. And then he, I think, bought a horse ranch or bought some horses and place out here. And they caught him one day down at the uh, park, below Knoll Park, right, right on the, with these super, high-powered cameras taking pictures of Mobile oh. and the shipyard and everything. Oh so my goodness. They hauled him away. You I don't remember know how you name? could take a picture from that far and there would be places, you know, that you, you could get a lot closer to the shipyard than that if you, you know, go out in the causeway and take pictures, but mm -hmm. he was pretty dumb to do that. Well, do you remember his name? No, he didn't listen. Well, he was not a, a, okay, oh, well, a local person. No, no, no. Just no he, was just, he needed an excuse to Come here, yeah. 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 But he had all these uh, thousands of dollars worth of cameras and all this kind of stuff. So. Gracious. Yeah. Well, I was young enough, I guess I didn't, I'm glad I didn't know how close it got. <laughs> yeah. we, we left here in 41 and didn't come back to 46, so we missed all that. Well, uh, I was married in 43. And um, Paul had graduated from, he was supposed to graduate from cadets. And uh, weddings in our family were always just horrendous. I mean, everything that could go wrong did go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> my mother's weddings, my sister's wedding, my wedding, you know, name it. Uh, my daughter's wedding. <laughs> mm -hmm. But they all went off all right. But, you know, it was behind the scenes. It was chaos. Mother and Bill were going to get married at a friend's house on Government Street in Mobile. And uh, they had the uh, fireplace all decorated with flowers and friends around and everything. And the minister came in and said, Can't marry you. This is the Baldwin County license. Oh, my <laughs> And so goodness. they thought they were going to have to go out and be married on the bridge, you know. <laughs> out on the causeway because they couldn't get married in Mobile. I don't know how that worked out, but that was kind of a, a big mess. And uh, when my sister got married, if, I, I guess you remember before air conditioning how oh, hot yeah. it was in yeah. July yeah. here, oh, yeah. when the sun was beaming down and the dust was thick. It's still that hot in July. And, <laughs> well, we lived, you know, right opposite the Episcopal Church, one block over mm -hmm. on Fairhope Avenue, and the Episcopal Church was on the next block. And my sister's wedding, she was married on the 2nd of July, I think. And um, they were taking pictures at the house before the ceremony. And they were, we were at the church. And they were just ready to go down the aisle. I mean, the, the bridesmaids had started down. And <coughs> Lois turned to Bill and she said, I don't have my flowers. Oh my. And he knew instantly where they were. You know, they were back at the house. He had on a white linen suit. You remember those? Everything was thick with dust. He ran through the backyard of the church, and there was a fence with vines, you know, running up between the houses back that faced north and, and oh the church. My he, he jumped over that, ran across Fairhope Avenue, and grabbed those flowers, ran back, jumped the fence, didn't miss a beat, walked <laughs> <in> <laughs> the in this white linen suit. And, you know, the, the 
bridesmaids had already started telling when he oh left. My and so he goes back and he and Lois come down the aisle and his face is just as red as can be and he's just kind of going. <laughs> and all these people say, isn't that sweet? And he's only her stepfather. <laughs> Because, you know, when you were a cadet, you not only couldn't be married back then, you know, until after you graduated, but you couldn't get a day off. I mean, you just, you were cadets, you were locked on base. And uh, so you were supposed to be married on a Sunday. He was supposed to get in on a Saturday afternoon. Tell me where he was a cadet. Is that uh, Columbus, Mississippi? Okay. And uh, so he would, he, they had bad weather and they weren't going to graduate at that time. So he had to fly that Saturday and Sunday and they were going to graduate on Monday or Tuesday and he couldn't get off. Oh my so the, I mean, the, the cake was bought, the, you know, the flowers, mm -hmm. the, everything was planned. So we kept calling. I'd call him and he would call me and back and forth. And back, and back then we had a uh, oper long distance operators in Mobile. We called mm -hmm. Mobile and got the long distance operator and so forth. So one day I'd been talking to Paul and I turned around and walked away from the phone and the phone rang and I went back and this young boy said, Maxine? I said, yes. And she said, you don't know me, but I'm the long distance operator and I was busy and didn't get a chance to listen in. Is Paul going to get home for the wedding? <laughs> about our local telephone operator, <laughs> but <laughs> that one was the mobile operator. Oh, that's funny. Oh, my goodness. They probably still do that. <laughs> I guess everything's automated now, though. Oh, oh, when I was living in Birmingham, Paul got this long telegram. He was flying for the airline at the time. It was right after the war, and he got this long telegram from the military offering him a regular commission to come back in. And uh, he wasn't there, so I, she was telling me this. And she said, "Pull up a chair and sit down. This is really long. It's going to take a while." The operator, you know, she phoning it and telling me all the stuff in this telegram. And so she <laughs> broke off in the middle. And she was laughing really hard. And I said, uh, "She said, I, I really shouldn't do this, but she said I just got to tell you this. It's so funny." She said, "We just got this telegram that said." It said, Papa died all at once. <laughs> oh and another funny thing, um, Aunt Frankie, you know, Crawford being the editor of the paper and Mother being a good friend, and the telephone operator was a friend, it just, you know, knew him really well. And when she'd get a fire call, she'd call Frankie, and Frankie would call Mother. And finally, Jack Titus was head of, he was a sheriff and he was head of the fire department back in those days. And he brought an ad in to Aunt Frankie. He said, I want you to run this ad on the front page of the paper. And it said, notice to Mrs. Francis Crawford and Mrs. William Funk, please stop embarrassing the fire department by getting to the fire before we do and having half the furniture <laughs> out of the house. <laughs> My question was, I hope she called the fire department first, but apparently she didn't. <laughs> I think she did, but the two of them could get they away quicker. They could get there faster. The fire truck could get everybody. Right, right. <laughs> this is bad as, as Dick Turner borrowing the fire truck. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but another time, um, I guess I must have been around 15 years old then, it was just a volunteer fire department. It was not organized the way it is today. And anybody who wanted to ran and got the fire truck when the siren went off. No particular fireman. Everybody, everybody you know. In. So uh, the kids used to jump on it, you know, help fire. So the siren went off, and these kids were hanging around my house, and Harold Taylor and a bunch of kids. And one of the boys from Mobile they had a license. He was a little older than the other. He had a driver's license. He said, come on, get the fire truck. He said, this is the craziest thing I ever heard. And they said, come on and get it. Like, We've got to go to the fire. So he jumped in and he's driving the fire truck. And they come out of the fire place, which is where the Welcome Center is now. 
and go across Fairhope Avenue, a half a block down, where there was Ruby's Garage, do you remember that? Mm -hmm. And the fire truck ran out of gas. Oh, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> um. <laughs> well, <laughs> they really needed a little organization, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> Mercy. And I remember the Friday night folk dance parties. You remember those? Mm -hmm. That was a lot of fun at Cummings Hall. Mm -hmm. Kept everybody entertained. And the Saturday night basketball games with the dances after. Oh, then we had a town team, and they played different teams from Mobile, and, and the Celtics, the world champions, would come through, and the, and the House of Davids, they'd have these oh, professional yeah, yeah. teams come through. and. Uh, I remember the Celtics very well because one time if they could really pass that ball and one of them got me right in the face. Oh no. Oh my goodness. <laughs> but uh, they, they would have these dances afterward and my folks would sit there because my older sister would, would be dancing, you know, and I can remember how beautifully Evelyn Porter, Evelyn Berlin Porter and, and uh, the Steel Boy, what was his name? Well, there was George. And George Steele. Mm -hmm. Oh, they could dance so beautifully together. I mean, I, we loved to watch them dance, but I can remember that uh, there were two people who every once in a while would come over and ask me to dance. I didn't know how to dance, but they would come <laughs> ask me anyway. Sammy Sant and Worth McHugh. Oh, <laughs> they would, how about that? <laughs> they would come over and I would get to dance at least one piece once in a while. Mm -hmm. Such fun. And they. They both wound up marrying the same Your woman at yeah. different times. <laughs> yeah, and Worth got killed in the war. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember that. I was uh, like ten years old, maybe. Did that thing in running it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh, it is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, we turned it off. No, we're we're recording every little every little syllable <laughs> for history. <laughs> I for posterity, excuse me. I remember uh, one time. The most popular girl in town was Julie Bauer. You remember Julie? Mm -hmm. And she just got rushed off her feet. I mean, that was the, that older crowd. Rushed off her feet at those Saturday night dances. And one night she went, got, she borrowed a suit from some young child in Fairhope, some youngster. Dressed with a tie and a suit and the boy, she, she, she borrowed Barney Gaston's shoes, I remember. I don't know where she got the rest of the clothes. And, uh, she went up there dressed like that, and she danced with all the girls. And she would not dance with any of the boys. Oh, she was a character. She was always doing something. And the boys would say, come on, Julie. She'd just ignore them. She'd go cut in on the girls. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the women's movement had arrived in Fairhope. <laughs> jeans, you know, but uh, in organic school, when I guess I was in junior high school, um, Kista McKinnis had a crush on David Tone, and uh, she stole a pair of his khaki pants from some place, you know, just the, the cutting up, you know, and she wore them to school with a white sweatshirt and white tennis shoes. Well, it became the school uniform for the girls. <laughs> and they wore, you remember that? Khaki pants and sweatshirt and moccasins it was. Yeah, mm -hmm. moccasins or tennis shoes. And uh, it, tr it trickled down to us. We, we wore it too. It got to be our uniform through school. <laughs> and uh, by choice, Flora May Goodard had a, a, I guess, a Model A Ford uh, roadster. And these girls used to, that group of girls who were older than I was, I got included in some of these things, but I wasn't with them this time. They would go to Pensacola or Mobile or, you know, do something on Sundays, just go exploring or something. But one, one day, they were all dressed in their khaki pants and their sweatshirts <laughs> and their moccasins. They decided to go to Mobile. And they were going down Government Street, and something happened to the car. They ran out of gas or something. They all piled out of that roadster, and here were all these girls in khaki pants and sweatshirts pushing this car down <laughs> Government Street. And they really caused a sensation. People in Mobile had never seen anything like that. No wonder Organic School got a good reputation for being so kooky. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Kentucky. <laughs> Imagine think, women wearing pants. <laughs> I think these things were going on when I was away in boarding school. Probably. <laughs> I, I remember the people, but I don't remember all the things that went on that time. Well, I remember how thrilled I was to have a weekend so I could put on my jeans and not have to wear a skirt. <laughs> but at school, we wore skirts, dresses. Oh, I remember something that happened when I was very small, and I have pictures of it someplace. Tom Thumb Wedding. It was one of these things that came to town. A group of people came. It was a way to make money, you know, touring. We had people who come in and with an airplane barnstormers and take people up riding for a dollar a ride and we had this man who'd come on the fourth of july and uh ride a balloon you know go up, take mm -hmm. a balloon up and everybody would come see the balloon go up but these were people just trying to eat you know they were mm -hmm. uh, and these people were putting it was like a theatrical troupe and they would come through some of them would put on minstrel shows and some of them would put on, and they would use local talent, but they would have the show and the, all that, the costumes and the script and everything. But they had these Tom Thumb weddings. They'd get all the kids in town, and they had all these costumes. They'd dress the kids up in of all sizes and everything. And uh, then, of course, all the parents and grandparents and friends would come. They'd get a great turnout for <laughs> all the kids in town up on that stage, you know. But uh, I was the bride. Mm. I was about as wide as I was high and had this straight hair like this. <laughs> <laughs> this little boy, I think his name was Green, his last name, his father ran the drugstore where Moyers mm -hmm. used to be on Grove Avenue. And he had curly hair and he was the groom. And uh, I can remember Willie Simmons. He was just a little kid, you know, and he sang Silver Threads Among the Gold. And I was so impressed. I can remember to this day. And I was just a little teeny kid. And the bride and groom sat in the middle, you know, and all the family was around. And my sister was one of the aunts. I guess that was the costume that fit her. And I had talked her into playing. I was a year and a half younger, but I had talked her into playing barber. And I cut her hair first. <laughs> and uh -oh. then I didn't let her cut mine. Oh. <laughs> and Daddy had to to give her this boy's haircut to, to try to even her hair up. <laughs> so she was not very happy about being in the thing. But um, it, anyway, they, we were sitting in the middle of the stage and uh, I dropped some ice cream on the floor. And this little gentleman sitting there in his tuxedo next to me gets out his handkerchief and he wipes up the ice cream off the floor, and then he turns around and he wipes my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was very nice of <laughs> Hmm, I'm glad we got you. Uh, you. You remember a lot of activities in Fairfield. Uh, the old minstrel shows were great. They were marvelous, and they were local people. I remember hearing about the Tom Thumb weddings. I may have seen one, but I don't really recall it. But I don't remember a minstrel show at all. <clears throat> they were they were much later. They were much after the. You know, I think probably before and after. <clears throat> I remember they had a womanless wedding back in the forties. Yeah, those were big things for oh, a while yeah. too. Yeah, but I think those were local people that put those. Right, they were local. They were not a right. touring group. It's not the PTA or somebody like yeah, that. It's not too long ago we had some of those. Well, they still do it. I mean, as bad as it is, they still do it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow. <laughs> Let's see. Let me see. Then, then after the war, what, what, well, I, of course, I wasn't here then. Um, well, tell me, do you remember the nudist colony? Oh, yes. Okay, well, tell us oh, about that. Oh, and the free love group. <laughs> there was yeah, a free love yeah, group, right. too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and tell us about what period of time you're talking about. Well, I guess the, well, that was, that was, that's kind of in the back of my mind, that free love group and the, the I'm talking about the first nudist colony, there was a later one, I'm thinking mm -hmm. of the earlier one that was associated with the free love group and the, and the, uh, <clears throat> this was the flapper years, I guess, in the 20s the or 20s, something, mm -hmm. early 30s or late 20s or, yeah. and, uh, they also had 
the brown shirt to the black shirts. There was a communist group and a, and a kind of a Nazi group or something, you know, the, uh, all these little cults were kind of popular all over back in those days and, and it was a small cell of that. I don't know if it was a brown shirt or a black shirt of, in Fairhope, I know, but I never did know who belonged to it, but I've heard about it. Do you remember anything about the Ku Klux Klan? The Ku Klux Klan. Oh, yes, I do. I was thinking about that the other day. I saw the march, and I was so little, I was sitting on my daddy's shoulders, you know, with my legs hanging. I was sitting on the back of his neck with my legs hanging over, I think, or else propped up. But I remember I was sitting up on his shoulders. And uh, I thought the, the Ku Klux Klan, and the, you know, little children get these funny ideas, was kind of a joke, something that's supposed to be kind of funny, because my daddy got such a kick out of it as they were marching down the Bay Hill, and we were standing on the side of the hill down there, and they were marching down the Bay Hill, and they had on their white sheets, and they had flares and crosses and all this, and, and my daddy was standing there laughing, and he was could tell everybody by the, you know, the way they walk or their shape, or their shoes, yeah. and he was saying, that's so good, and he put his name and all, all these people, and they were all laughing and getting such a kick out of it that I, I mean, to me, the, the Ku Klux Klan was not a fearful thing. I guess maybe the people that were in it in Fairhope were not fearful people. I guess they didn't scare anybody. <laughs> well, they certainly didn't scare other white people. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I really, my daddy seemed to think they were a bunch of nuts. No, he was right. <laughs> Well, I remember hearing that um, there was a Ku Klux Klan. By the time I came along, I think it had pretty well disbanded. After yeah, all. it didn't last long here. It wasn't something that, that uh -uh. took hold. And it was a small group, I remember. I forgot what I was going to say now. <laughs> <laughs> Sound like okay. flow. Yeah, getting there. I'm, I'm just, it's my, it just goes one ear, one ear and out the other. I'll, I can remember some funny things that happened about Paul. <laughs> um, they lived up where the florist is now on Section Street, South Section Street, and Morphy Avenue, and it was a cottage then. And uh, he would climb over the fence and get away. And his mother had him in his little overalls and she tied the back of his overalls to the clothesline mm -hmm. so he couldn't get over the fence. And he was just a little teeny thing with curly hair and people all over Fairhope tell me this story. <coughs> he came out of the overalls and went over the fence and went downtown. Just <laughs> 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 put your clothes on. <laughs> he was just a little teeny tiny oh. he was running around and no clothes on. <laughs> oh, that's funny. And another funny now, thing. Now that's Paul didn't tell us that when he was on tape. <laughs> Did he tell you the one about his father driving the car down Fairhope Avenue <clears throat> from Organic School, heading toward the bay, and everybody was so friendly and waving to him and saying, hi, Paul, Paul, you know, wait. He said, boy, everybody's so friendly today. He didn't know that Paul, who was about six, was holding onto the back bumper, and he was going so fast that he couldn't let go. Oh my <laughs> Paul was having to run as fast as the car was going, <laughs> and, <laughs> and oh if he let go, he'd been splattered. <laughs> and everybody was trying to stop Paul, and Paul Sr., you know, he was just waving back. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Did anybody talk about the time that was Larry Harper died? Yes, I think wasn't Paul in yeah. down there when that happened? Yeah. I think he, he talked, talked about, about that. Him talked about Arthur that. Keller talked about yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was, a I didn't go. I'm, I'm not one to go where there's wrecks and disasters and things like that, but my folks went down there. And uh, it was like a scene out of Huck Finn, you know, at night with all the people standing around with flares and they were mm -hmm. trying to find this body in the, in the water, and this bottomless pit and all that. It was, <coughs> that was a really a bad, really bad thing. thing. We had a lot of drownings and accidents in Fairhope, but I guess not a lot being right on the bay and we didn't have any well, you know, um, rules or regulations back I, in those when days. When I came along, we had a sign up on the pier that said, caution. Uh, it said a great big sign across the, from one bench that was covered to the other bench. 
It said, uh, caution, nine lives have been lost here because danger signs were disregarded. No diving from the pier. We did it all the, the time. There were no signs or anything. I know well, about the pier all the time. <laughs> so I, a number of kids got But we knew hurt. the tides. We know we could look at so how high something was at like that. A number of what? Excuse me, Flo. A number of kids got hurt, but they uh, were mobile kids or from away from here. Mm -hmm. I, I, I never had any of my friends get hurt. So we there, knew how to handle this. Yeah, that was. Uh, one the, the Josephs. Josephson, yeah, mm -hmm. Skyler yeah. Josephson. And there was one, uh, one from, mm -hmm. um, well down towards Barnes, Barnwell, uh, that we knew that broke his neck. And um, later on, there were some more, and one of my but the children's most acquaintances mm -hmm. was injured <clears throat> there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that can happen anywhere. Mm -hmm. That's right. If people won't. Pay attention. Or even if they do, yeah. if you happen to just <coughs> slip. slip or hit something wrong. But that was such a wonderful place to swim and dive. We had the diving boards, you know, and the platforms up from the big chutes and the little chutes. And uh, then out at the end of the pier, we had a high diving board out there. And it was like 14 feet of water where the bay boat used to dock. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> I remember one summer. I was determined I was going to learn to do a one and a half flip. I, I love to dive, and I did back flips and front flips and all these fancy dives. And, and Al Benick and Bobby Young and all those older guys used to coach me. They like, mm -hmm. helped me along with it. <laughs> anyway, I thought of something really funny. But anyway, uh, that year, I, I would go out and I would go off this high board and I would do the turn, but I didn't get the snap, but you came out, you have to snap, you know. So I would go in head first, but my feet and legs went in like this. Mm -hmm. And I had bruises <laughs> both oh. of my thighs like this all summer long because my legs hitting the water flat. Oh, I yeah. finally learned how to do it, but at a cost. <laughs> but one time we were at the, if there were a crowd of people at the big shoots, and Bobby and all that bunch of people were there all the older boys, and I was about 12 or 13, I guess, and I dove off, I did some kind of fancy dive and went off the thing, and I had on a little tank suit, you know, like this, <laughs> a little skirt on it, and I picked up a fish. Oh my goodness. <laughs> As I went in the weather, and it was going, <laughs> and I was, I came up screaming hysterically, which is screaming. And he thought I had hurt myself badly, and I scrambled for out of that water so fast, and, and, and I knew this fish, and I was just in there screaming. And so finally, they saw what the problem was, and here they were down and trying to get this fish. And everybody standing around. And this fish was it was, it was more hysterical than I was. And another time, um, Ellen Jane Waller, you remember Ellen Jane? She was from Michigan, and she went to organic school, she and her brother. And they lived in the house that Jack Hayes lives in, and up at uh, Montrose. And uh, she came down with the very latest things in bathing suits, this rubber bathing suit, two-piece. It had a little snap right here, you know, where the mm -hmm. top went up like this. And, and uh, really good looking. She goes down at the bay and dives off, and whoosh, the top split open. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and there was, of course, a crowd around. Ellen couldn't come out of the water. <laughs> oh. That's when you need a big beach towel. <laughs> we didn't fool with towels back in those days. Mm -hmm. Isn't that funny? Uh, I don't remember ever taking a towel. Never, ever used a towel. We just went to the bay. <laughs> we got up in the morning and put on our bathing suits and ate breakfast and went to the bay, walked down to the bay met the crowd down there, came home for lunch, ate in our bathing suits, went back down to the bay, came home, took a bath, got dressed, ate dinner, and went out on a date. <laughs> that was our day. <laughs> well, as we, when we got older, we went out on a date. In the summertime, I didn't mm -hmm. take it. If you went to the organic school, you probably didn't go on dates during the week. Oh. <laughs> didn't I? 